This is the Youth Bible with Nikki and Pippa Gumbel, day 107. It seems like our lives are chock full of stuff that keeps us from spending time with God. There's always something going on and lots of things to do that keep us from just sitting down and spending quality time together. Maybe you don't even know what it looks like to lead a God-centered life. Maybe the very thought of it overwhelms you and you think you're too busy or that you have no idea where to start. But Jesus said the most important thing in your life is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And that's what it means to be God-centered. He also said if you love him and follow his commands, he will bless you. So how do we go about leading a God-centered life? William Temple, like his father before him, was Archbishop of Canterbury. Among his many remarkable achievements, he wrote a superb commentary on the Gospel of John. He wrote the entire commentary entitled Readings in St. John's Gospel while praying on his knees before God. About worship, he wrote, Worship is a submission of all our nature to God. It's the quickening of conscience by his holiness, the nourishment of mind with his truth, the purifying of imagination by his beauty the opening of the heart to his love, the surrender of will to his purpose, and all this gathered up in adoration. Worship saves us from being self-centered and makes us God-centered. You were created to live in a relationship with God. That should be your number one priority. If you put God first in your life, all kinds of blessings follow. Because God loves you, he warns you of the dangers of disregarding the design for your life. But what does it mean to lead a God-centered life? And what steps do you need to take in order to get there? From Psalm 47 Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. First, worship God. You are invited to worship God. Worship, in this psalm, sounds quite emotional and noisy. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. God has ascended amid shouts of joy. The Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. It also includes lots of singing. There is great exuberance in worship as adoration and amazement of God bubbles over in extravagant action. These are all outward ways of expressing your worship of the Lord. Worship includes the use of emotions to express your love and gratitude to God and to bring Him honour. All relationships involve emotions. I don't say to Pippa, I love you with my mind. What I say is, I love you with my whole being, my mind, my heart, my will. We're good at expressing our emotions in other contexts, such as football matches or other sporting events. Then why should it be any different in our worship of God? Lord, today I submit myself to you. Quicken my conscience with your holiness. Nourish my mind with your truth. Purify my imagination with your beauty. Open my heart to your love. I surrender my all to your purpose. I worship and adore you. New Testament from Luke 18 Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge, and there was a widow, who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones, who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice, and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, 
robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus called the little children to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Peter said to him, We have left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, No one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. Second step to a God-centered life. Pray consistently. The God-centered life is a life of consistent prayer. Jesus taught his disciples to always pray and not give up. You can talk to God, not just in church or in set times of prayer, but anywhere and at any time. I was taught very early in my Christian life to talk as you walk through the day. Jesus tells the parable of the widow and the unjust judge who eventually gives in to her demands in order to stop her bothering him and wearing him out. Jesus says that if an unjust judge will listen to a widow's plea, how much more will God listen to those who cry out to him day and night? Never give up praying and pray hardest when it's hardest to pray. Third step, humble yourself. Humility is not something that happens to you. It's something that you're supposed to do to yourself. Rather than exalting yourself, you're supposed to humble yourself. God promises that he will exalt you. If we compare ourselves with others, we may become like the Pharisee, thanking God that we're not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers. The Pharisee was confident of his own righteousness. He fell into the trap of trusting himself. If our lives are truly God-centered, our conscience is quickened by his holiness. We compare ourselves with him, and all we can say is, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. The truth is that we are all sinners, and we're all in need of God's mercy. I find it very easy to read this passage and to thank God that I'm not like the Pharisee. But by doing so, I fall into the very trap that Jesus is describing, thinking I'm more righteous than others, rather than recognizing my sin and need for God. This is exactly the sin of the Pharisee. Fourth step, be childlike. Sometimes the babies, children, or young people in a church are described as the church of the future. But according to Jesus, they're not just the church of the future, they're the church of today. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Jesus calls us to become like children. He never tells us to be childish in the sense of being simplistic, but he does tell us to be childlike. To be childlike is the opposite of being independent and grown up. Children tend to be open, receptive, trusting, humble, loving and forgiving. The God-centered life is a life of childlike dependence on him. You become childlike when you show and share your honest feelings, acknowledge how fragile and vulnerable you are and how much you need God and other people. Children are instinctively driven to explore and discover. They neither dwell in the past nor settle for the present, but look forward with an unquenchable curiosity to the future, fueled by wonder and an immense capacity for enjoyment. Cultivate this freedom to respond instinctively like a child and to feel and express wonder, awe, love and joy, to rush in and eagerly explore, probe and discover things for yourself. Fifth step, follow Jesus. There is nothing more rewarding than following Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, We've left all we had to follow you. Jesus replies, I tell you the truth, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. 
Jesus calls the rich young ruler to the God-centered life. He calls him to give up everything else and follow him. Perhaps Jesus saw in him the potential to be like the Apostle Peter or Matthew or one of the others who responded positively when Jesus said, follow me. The more we accumulate, the harder it is to live God-centered lives. The rich young ruler became very sad because he was very wealthy. It's not impossible for the rich to enter the kingdom of God, but it's very hard. Not because the standards are higher, but because the risk appears greater. In fact, it's impossible for any one of us, including the rich, to enter the kingdom of God on the strength of our own performance. Yet with God, it's possible for anyone, including the rich, to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus says what is humanly impossible is possible with God. Neither your past failings nor your present circumstances need determine your future. With God, all things are possible. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Give me a childlike faith and dependence on you and help me to be willing to give up everything else in order to follow you wholeheartedly. Old Testament from Deuteronomy 28 The sky over your head will be bronze, the ground beneath you iron, because you did not serve the Lord your God joyfully and gladly in the time of prosperity. Sixth step to a God-centered life, serve God. In this passage, we see the disastrous consequences of not living the God-centered life, not obeying the law, not carefully following his command, and not serving the Lord. We also see the disastrous consequences of this within Israel's own history. In my own life, I've seen a glimpse of some of the things described, especially in the years before I experienced a relationship with God. The sky over your head will be bronze. I've experienced the sense what seems to be a great separation from God. We see how the Lord will give you an anxious mind, eyes weary with longing and a despairing heart. You will live in constant suspense, filled with dread both day and night, never sure of your life. Worry is a cycle of inefficient thoughts whirling around a center of fear. This is the opposite of the peace and joy that Jesus offers. Of course, sometimes I have failed to serve, obey and follow his command wholeheartedly. The wonderful news of the New Testament is that Jesus has rescued us from the deserved punishment and curses that would have otherwise followed. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Lord, thank you so much that you died in my place so that I can be forgiven and set free from the consequences that I deserve. Thank you that you call me to a God-centered life. Help me to worship you wholeheartedly to serve you joyfully and gladly, and to obey and follow you always. Pepper adds, In Luke 18, verse 1, we read about the parable of the persistent widow. I have looked back over some of my prayers that I've prayed that haven't been answered yet. I think I need to redouble my efforts and not give up. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, help me to put you at the centre of my life. Help me to have everything focus around you. Give me strength today. In Jesus' name, Amen.